Okay, good evening, folks. This is Mary Sue Lanigan. I'm the Executive Director at Michigan Parkinson Foundation, and I am pleased to be able to uh, present a program this evening on deep brain stimulation. The program is being presented by both a Parkinson Movement Disorder Specialist, Dr. Aaron Ellen Bogan, who is with the Michigan Institute of Neurological Disorders, and Dr. Michael Stout, who is a functional neurosurgeon. So you're going to hear about it from both perspectives. And we're going to start out this evening with Dr. Ellen Bogan. So I hope that you find this very informative and come away with some uh, good information that will help you in any kind of future decision-making um, for your treatment options. All right, Dr. Ellen Bogan, you can take it away there. <laughs> I'm going to Thank mute everybody soon. except for Dr. Bob uh, <coughs> Bogan. Okay, so go Thank ahead. you, Mary Sue, and good evening, everyone. Um, of course, you know, we're going to spend a little bit of time tonight discussing uh, deep brain stimulation, but I'm hoping that one of the things that everyone will walk away with is correcting some misconceptions that people have. Uh, and I'll share an example of something that happened today with a patient who was under the impression based on a conversation that we had that he wasn't a candidate for DBS because he was under the impression that it was really for people that the medication wasn't working. And um, this is a misconception and we'll build to sort of get to that point of discussing that um, and, and really trying to identify who are the right people. But we're gonna start by just discussing what Parkinson's disease is. And I know that you know, for most of you, this is very, very basic. And so I was gonna really try to keep things quite simple. Remember that the, the principal problem in Parkinson's disease is the de degeneration of neurons in the brain in an area called the substantia nigra that produce dopamine. And dopamine serves as a neurotransmitter that really helps to regulate and control movements. It, it serves as both a a gas pedal and a brake, if you will, on, on a system that involves a number of other neurotransmitters. So we get this imbalance of dopamine, acetyl, other neurotransmitters, which ultimately leads to the symptoms that we recognize as Parkinson's disease. And it really takes about a, a significant amount of degeneration to really have these symptoms develop into what we know as Parkinson's disease. And by the time that the motor symptoms of Parkinson's have developed, people have lost anywhere between 60 to 80% of those dopamine producing neurons. So the medications that are used to treat Parkinson's disease really by and large are used to regulate this dopamine system. Some of them such as levodopa get converted into dopamine. There are medications like dopamine agonists that actually mimic dopamine and bind to dopamine receptors. Uh, there are drugs that impair or inhibit enzymes, which break down dopamine. So one that does that in the central nervous system is are, are drugs that, such as rosagiline, um, that will slow the breakdown of dopamine, whether it's produced by the brain naturally or as exogenous dopamine that is in the form of levodopa. There's COMT inhibitors, which also break block the breakdown of dopamine. Um, this is a little bit more debatable whether the effect is entirely on the peripheral nerve, the peripheral, periphery outside of the central nervous system, or if there's some action within the central nervous system itself. But in the end, really what we're doing with all of these medications is trying to modulate dopamine and improve movement. There are some newer medications such as estradiazoline that work outside of this dopamine system, um, but that's really the exception rather than the rule. So. Of course, the mainstay of treatment for people who have these, besides, of course, exercise, which I really can't stress enough, are our pharmaceutical options or medications. And you can see here a timeline, and this is not exhaustive, but that in the 1960s, uh, levodopa was first used. And for those of you who have seen the movie Awakenings, uh, it is a cinematic uh, presentation of some of those early uses of levodopa. And in that case, it was people who had post-encephalitic Parkinsonism. And so 
it, it's dramatized, but certainly gives us a glimpse into what things may have been like. Eventually, carbidopa was added to levodopa and other countries benzericide as well. And this just allows us to use smaller doses of levodopa because it blocks the, the breakdown of, of levodopa peripherally and therefore allows us to use lower doses, which actually help really reduce side effects that people experience as well. Then in the 1990s, we saw some new drugs come into play, the COMT, COMT inhibitors, which I mentioned before, dopamine agonists um, in the late 90s, and then a continuous release form of carbidopa levodopa was available as well. Um, that is different than the extended release formulation that we'll discuss in a, in a couple moments as we move ahead. In the 2000s, we started getting drugs that were combination therapies, so carbidopa and levodopa with entacapone, which is a COMT inhibitor. Um, injectable apomorphine is actually a very interesting drug. It's been around in one formulation or another, uh, but it's approved for a rescue therapy. So when patients who, or people who have Parkinson's start to feel their medication wear off, and so it can be something that really is a stopgap in, in an effort to try to manage Parkinson's symptoms. Then the rotigotine patch and then MAOB inhibitors like Rosagiline. There were prior MAOB inhibitors date back to the 1980s. Um, you are, you are. That date back to the 1980s, which also can uh, have some uh, debatability debate over what effect they truly have. And then in the 2010s, we have uh, extended release formulations of dopamine agonists. You can see here another formulation of carbidopa levodopa, uh, and then an enteral suspension, which is the duopa gel that's delivered via a PEG or J tube. Um, oral inhalation of levodopa, and then I had mentioned this uh, adenosine agonist before estradiafeline. So one of the, the themes here really is that if you look at what 60s to the current day, although we've had other medications that have come into play, much of what has been done really centers around levodopa and improving upon it, delivering it in different ways, having different formulations and so on. And I can tell you that this continues to be a focus of, of research even for development of symptomatic therapies for Parkinson's disease. But there are limitations, especially to oral medications. We know that, that Parkinson's disease is really not just a brain disorder, although that's where the primary neurodegeneration occurs. And in fact, we know that many of the symptoms outside of the brain can precede the, the classic symptoms that we think of. So we can see involvement of the entire GI tract from the mouth where people may have uh, hypersalivation or drooling as a result of uh, not swallowing as much. But, but one of the big things that happens is that the GI tract becomes quite unpredictable. And this leads to variability in response to medication. And that variability leads to unpredictability. And things that happen include uh, delays in medication working, or at times even dose failures, where people take a dose of their medication and they seem not to have any response to the medication at all. And this gets back to really the, the idea that I opened with, is that for someone like that, it's not that their medication isn't working. It's simply the fact that the disease is leading to an impairment in our ability to deliver medication through the GI tract appropriately. And so one of the things that we do is we will sometimes actually start to use some of those other formulations of medications that um, start to rely on other ways of delivering outside of the GI tract. So you had seen that there is the rotigotine patch, there's the injectable medications such as apomorphine injections, uh, there are the, uh, the Duopa uh, medication, a PEG tube or a J tube that is and inserted directly into the GI tract itself. Um, but other things that come into play as well, as the disease progresses and we have a shortened duration of response to medication, um, we start to see that people often forget to take their medication in a timely fashion. And it's quite understandable. The more times we ask someone to do something, the harder it is to really stay on track with it. So if someone starts taking their levodopa uh, on an every five or six hour basis, three times a day, gradually they find that they may need to take it in a shorter interval, uh, going to four and then three hours and sometimes even shorter. 
which means they're taking more doses during the day. And it's easy to get sidetracked and get off track with medication. But the problem is that many people will then pay the price where they now have a, a marked increase in their symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So in early Parkinson's, what we often see is really a honeymoon phase where people um, don't necessarily tell or can't tell a difference from one dose of medication to the next. And quite frankly, they may be able to miss many doses of medication before they start to notice that their Parkinson's symptoms are starting to get worse. This TW on the left here is actually the therapeutic window. And that's really where we want to keep people in terms of their medication so that it's not overdosing them, it's not underdosing them, but it's the optimal way of actually treating the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And you can see here that although there may be some variability, the therapeutic window is so broad that there's not a lot of change in the control of symptoms from dose to dose. And so people's symptoms can be fairly easily managed with medication. However, as you can see, as the disease progresses, uh, first of all, you see people taking more doses of medication. Uh, the other thing is that we see these fluctuations through the therapeutic window where patients may at times be beyond it and develop uh, dyskinesia, those extra involuntary movements that are writhing or twisting or sometimes jerking movements. Uh, the other thing that we see is that dosing interval shortens dramatically. And so it's much easier to either rise too quickly through the therapeutic window or fall below where then there's a reemergence of Parkinson's symptoms. And then when you start to intermix other issues with this, because again, we're relying on oral medications uh, where food effect can play a role and can lead to dose failures um, and, and other aspects of the disease itself, as I mentioned before, start to lead to this unpredictability. So again, it's not that people aren't responding to medication, but in essence, what's really happening is the disease is impacting how people do respond in terms of how they absorb the medication. And therefore, uh, we see this unpredictability. And I think in many cases, in the people that I see and treat for their Parkinson's, it's the lack of predictability and the lack of consistency that often drives them to seek alternatives to what we have available with oral medications. The goal in the end for how we try to manage motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease is actually to optimize or maximize their, their time or when the medication is working and minimize the off time where they have reemergence of their symptoms. And so this becomes more of a challenge and we see more fluctuations and you can see that variability and fluctuation between on time and off time. And the problem is with that narrowing therapeutic window, we start to see more dyskinesia and that at times can be quite troublesome for people. One of the strategies, and I, I want to emphasize that one of the strategies only is um, using a surgical intervention. And so that's where deep brain stimulation comes in. Many people, of course, have a very strong interest in DBS, and there are others who are really quite uh, concerned about the idea of a surgery to manage Parkinson's disease. Just to give you a little bit of a timeline, deep brain stimulation was actually approved as a therapy in 1997 to treat tremor and Parkinson's disease. And there's, we'll go through a timeline of how this has evolved, but just to reassure people that this is actually something that has a fairly long history. And in the end, what DBS can offer people who have Parkinson's is really trying to capture more of their good time, more of that quality time where the, the medication, mimicking the effects of medication when it's working at its best. And so, just to remind you of that individual who thought that it was something that was a, really a last resort. Um, on the contrary, we want to make sure that people who are really considered for this as a way of managing their Parkinson's, it's not necessarily a last resort. They still have to be responding to medication, but we want to really capture and enhance that good time and try to keep people at their best for much longer periods during the course of the day. Here's some videos of some uh, patients who have actually gone through DBS and you can see here, actually I'll pause that one. You can see here, this is with the DBS turned off and we'll come back to her a, a little bit later. She has a lot of reemergent tremor, um, but she has significant rest tremor in her legs as well. In this individual here, you can see there's fairly pronounced, um, fairly pronounced tremor. 
And this is just showing his device and the fact that it is turned off there. This is an individual, you'll see his gait. And I think that many people recognize this, this gait as one that uh, is not uncommon in people who have more advanced Parkinson's disease with the shortened steps and a little bit of uh, difficulty with turning, uh, that hesitancy. There may even be a little bit of freezing um, that's intruding into that. He has a loss of arm swing and um, of course has balance issues and is utilizing a cane to try to help manage that. So moving to the next slide, if you remember the prominence of her tremor before, and you can see now that the tremor in her legs is gone, the tremor in her hands both at rest and um, with postural maintenance where we saw that re-emergent tremor has gone. Um, this next gentleman, remember we saw him with the device turned off and then it's turned back on here. And you can see how that quieted his tremor right down. The little clue here is when it was off, that screen had a red line on it. And now it has a green line on it. So just as a, a clue of what we're seeing there. And then finally, if you remember this gentleman and his walking with the cane and the short stride and so on, um, we see he's got good arm swing, his balance is better. Certainly his stride length is much better. He turns more easily. And so um, you know, that, that's someone who really is a home run in terms of his response to uh, deep brain stimulation therapy. So I, I want you to understand that you know, these are some sort of best examples, if you will. Um, and this isn't necessarily representative of what everyone gets out of DBS. But one of the things that's important to really communicate with your own physician is what are the goals and what are the expectations? And I think that that has to be a really serious discussion in determining if someone may be appropriate for uh, deep brain simulation surgery as a way of managing Parkinson's disease. So as I had mentioned, we talk, we'll talk a little bit about a timeline here. You can see the initial discovery um, really began in the 1930s and through the 60s and you know, stimulating different regions of the brain at high frequency can reduce symptoms. What that does in essence is it blocks pathways. So it's not that it's stimulating it and thinking of it delivering as medication, but on the contrary, it's actually impairing some of these pathways that lead to the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, including tremor and, and dyskinesia and so on. Um, the history is actually really quite interesting because the history started with lesioning of the brain. And uh, some of these areas were found really by happenstance, people who had a condition then had a stroke and their symptoms related to their condition actually resolved or improved significantly. Then there was development of prototypes and then the initial approval in 1997 with subsequent approvals in Parkinson's disease um, for motor fluctuations and dyskinesia in addition to tremor. Then what's happened is there's been a lot of innovation. So once there's this development and there's uptake, now there's innovation. And I would, as an analogy, um, think about the auto industry and the innovation that's occurring with batteries in the electric vehicle segment. And so many of those same technologies in terms of battery life and so on, ultimately can be applied to um, the innovation that's occurring in other industries that use batteries, such as deep brain stimulation. And the other things that we're able to do now is we're able to deliver the stimulation rather than just thinking of it as a sphere that is around an area that's being stimulated, we can actually change the direction and we can split those charges and so on. And so it really allows us to refine how we treat people uh, and individualized therapy even more. So the, you know, I like to think of it in a way as you know, the, the product standardization is sort of the old color televisions and the innovation cycle. As a result, we now get that, that high definition, if you will. And so comparing you know, TV technology as an example. So how does DBS work? And this is really looking, um, and Dr. Stout will talk more about this in detail. It, it's a surgical procedure where there's an electrode implanted into one of a few possible areas in the brain, depending on what the, the main target is, as well as um, some other characteristics for each individual patient. It's connected to a battery type device in the chest or a pacemaker in the chest, and it sends electrical impulses into the electrode that's placed in, in the areas of the brain that are targeted. What this does is this actually helps to block some of those abnormal signals and thus stabilizes the, uh, 
the brain signals and reduces the involuntary movements that occur. So it's a very simplistic way of looking at this um, in terms of something that can be quite complicated and is really very elegant in how it delivers it, especially when we have the ability to refine our treatment so carefully for each patient individually. But what the end goal is, is I had mentioned before, is to really try to use brain stimulation in combination with medications to smooth out motor function during the course of the day. And it, in some ways, is like setting the clock back for patients. And so it allows us to provide better control. Hopefully, in many cases, we see a reduction in medication, although that's not the explicit goal in most cases, but it's really to try to improve that stability and maintain that state of motor control in, in a much more predictable and stable fashion than you saw with individuals who are taking sometimes five, six, seven doses of oral medication a day. And we can utilize the combination of DVS as well as the medication to try to really thread that needle and stay in the therapeutic window for, um, for people who do go through this process. And as a reminder, DBS isn't a last resort. Um, the, the things that we look for in terms of people who may be good candidates for uh, surgery would be people who have Parkinson's disease symptoms, typically for at least five years. One of the reasons that we try to wait for that time frame is, and, and I've had this experience where people seem to be progressing a little bit more rapidly. And it turns out that some of the people who are initially diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, then ultimately are diagnosed with other conditions that are the atypical Parkinsonian syndrome. So multiple system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy, and so on. And those individuals tend to lose their levodopa response if they had one initially. Um, and therefore, they really aren't good candidates because, again, the expectation is to really try to capture and mimic the best response to medication that a person's experiencing and maintain that throughout a larger portion of the day. Um, they have to, of course, be a reasonable surgical candidate, so not have other health issues that may preclude them from undergoing surgery. Um, they have to have uh, relatively good cognition, so part of the process for deep brain stimulation for individuals with Parkinson's disease is actually a battery of uh, tests called neuropsychological testing, and this is a very careful and detailed way of looking at both uh, mood as well as cognitive impairment. And then, of course, um, the people have to actually respond to medication. And so one of the final steps that we undertake prior to actually giving the, the approval to go ahead and go through the surgery is a levodopa challenge or an on-off testing, where we ask people to come in after they've gone um, ideally as much as 12 hours without their medications, assess those individuals when they haven't taken their medication, have them take their regular medication, and then reassess them and document how much improvement there is in their motor symptoms with their medication. And again, there's some thresholds that we look at to really try to gauge whether someone is appropriate for uh, surgery or not, because we want to try to do everything we can to maximize success. And so if we don't carefully evaluate people ahead of time, then that's really the rate limiting step in terms of optimizing and maximizing one's opportunity for success. So the effects of DBS on movement disorders really um, helps to reduce involuntary movements by stabilizing the circuits of, of the brain that are affected by Parkinson's disease. We tell people sometimes to think about this as an electrical version of dopamine, just as a concept, although it really doesn't have anything directly to do with dopamine itself. But one of the advantages of DBS is we actually can make adjustments. So if there's a side effect, or if we're not seeing the result that we want, we can go back, we can take a step back, adjust the program that we're utilizing. Uh, there are so many parameters that we're able to adjust, including which contact we use, the rate of stimulation, the amplitude of stimulation, and so on, that we can refine each person's uh, programming for their individual symptoms in their case. And again, the goal isn't to get people off of medication, but some studies suggest that there is about a 50% reduction in medication in appropriately select 
And then you know, again, the symptoms that tend to respond well to deep brain stimulation are things like tremor and rigidity, slowness of movement, and then dyskinesia as well. People often worry about things like freezing of gait. And the answer typically is that if freezing of gait is an off symptom that responds well to the oral medications, then it is something that we can be hopeful about responding to DBS as well. But as a, for those individuals who unfortunately suffer freezing of gait, even when their medication is working, this isn't something that we would expect to correct that problem. So again, symptoms that tend to respond well to levodopa often improve with DBS. Things that are less responsive, again, that on freezing that I'd mentioned, people's balance tends not to improve, speech issues, swallowing issues, writing issues tend not to improve. There can be side effects. So of course, there isn't a cure for Parkinson's disease to date, although there are certainly a number of treatments to either slow down the disease that are in development, or uh, hopefully we will ultimately find something that can stop the progression. And then the, the goal is, of course, finding a cure where we can reverse all the symptoms. First line therapy, again, is medication and, um, of course, exercise therapies and so on. But when necessary, surgical treatments are also potentially available. Um, it's always weighing the risk versus the benefits as to who is appropriate for DBS. And you know, certainly there can be things like worsening depression, which can be temporary or permanent. And, but most side effects from DBS are actually temporary and can correct themselves over time, either by subsiding slowly on their own or by making adjustments in the DBS programming. So this is just one example of what a system looks like. Um, certainly it's changed in the 20 years or so since I first learned how to program these, uh, but you can see, uh, and Dr. Stout can take you into a little more detail because he works with these tools before they're implanted and is the one who implants them, but there's a battery type device. There's an electrode that gets connected. There's the contacts themselves, which are, uh, implanted into the brain. And you can see that there's various contacts along here. Uh, there's a, a cap that actually locks it in place in the skull itself. This is this large iPad looking tablet is one um, that we use for programming, but and there's a patient controller as well. And so that they're based on whatever settings may have been arranged with your doctor, um, you may have some ability to adjust this in your own right. Um, the systems are really by and large the same. I mean, there's nuances with each one, but for patients, I think it's really a, a much more seamless process and you don't have to worry about the different programs. And there's some, there's some advantages and disadvantages to each. Uh, one of the advantages with this Abbott uh, device, for example, is the opportunity to use virtual clinics. And so what this means is once a person has DVS implanted and, and it's set up appropriately, we have the ability to actually program DBS and make adjustments remotely. And so this is, to me, a, a really unique and wonderful opportunity because we have a state where there are a lot of people who may not have ready access to someone who is a movement disorder specialist and a functional neurosurgeon uh, close at hand. And so this can really open doors for people who may live away from the main areas where this is being done in Michigan um, you know, there's a handful of places that this is being done, the Metro Detroit area, um, Ann Arbor, and then out in uh, Grand Rapids, and, you know, there's a, a here and there in Midland and in Saginaw, and I think that covers the entire state. Um, so you can see that there's a line of demarcation um, somewhere along M10, or you, I'm not sure if it's M10, but that cuts through Midland and cuts across the state, where north of there, there's really not any DBS being done. And so for individuals who may come from areas that are much harder to access centers that are doing this, this is a way to minimize their travel after the implantation and allow us to program in a remote fashion. And so I think that that is something that is really unique and can offer a lot to the state of Michigan. The good news is, and this is something that a lot of people will ask is regarding the cost and the coverage, because this is an FDA approved treatment, if we're using this for Parkinson's disease, which is on label, uh, it is really by and large covered by insurance. Uh, each individual insurance policy may handle a little bit differently. And of course, people have their various deductibles and co-pays, but this is something that I, I can't recall the last time that cost was really 
a, a factor in people deciding whether or not they were going to pursue DBS as a treatment for their Parkinson's disease. So, you know, as you saw in the original slide, um, there is now, and, and as Mary Sue mentioned, there's now a program through Ascension and uh, what is the old Crittenden Hospital in Rochester. So it's Ascension, uh, Rochester, Ascension Providence, Rochester. And you know, if you are someone who thinks you would like to be considered for DBS, of course, really the first discussion is probably with your neurologist who's treating your Parkinson's disease. Um, and if the DBS is something that is desired to pursue further, uh, Ascension has a, uh, a nurse navigator. Um, and you can see here the contact information for Michelle Davies, and there's a phone number. And it's really, the process is intended to be really streamlined and simple for people who want to go through this. And so it will help with all the, the scheduling of appointments and answer questions, help with um, the concierge services for people that are coming from out state and so on. And then there's also you know, other opportunities for therapies and services for individuals with movement disorders. So there's LSVT big and loud, there's the balance and neurological therapy and general rehabilitation services. And of course, um, you can find these, these uh, resources online as well through the Ascension website. Um, and then there's also um, other opportunities through like the Old Persons Commission in Rochester uh, where there are classes and so on. And so I was gonna stop there and actually turn things over to Dr. Stout. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. All right, thank you, Dr. Alan Logan. I think I have the power now. There we go. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you to Mary Sue for giving me the opportunity to talk today. We're very excited to start this new program at Ascension. Uh, Dr. Alan Bogan went over a litany of details in terms of uh, the indications for DBS and how uh, Parkinson's, um, the pathology of Parkinson's. I'd like to focus more on the surgical aspect of what deep brain simulation surgery entails, specifically what we're trying to accomplish um, at Ascension um, and kind of answer any questions that may arise regarding any type of uh, any aspect of surgery. So I'll retread a couple slides that Dr. Alamo already talked about. Deep brain simulation we use for movement disorders primarily, although there are under other indications. Um, Dr. Alamo did say I'll talk more about the mechanism. To be fair, we actually don't know exactly how it works yet. And although he said it's electrical dopamine, uh, we all, I always say to my patients, it's like a pacemaker for the brain. It uses electricity to regulate aberrant brain activity. Uh, most are performed awake. Sometimes we do perform it asleep, depending on the patient and the indication. Uh, but awake test, awake uh, surgery is very important for us to be able to test the patients, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. So the movement disorders of mammal surgery. Obviously, we're here at the Parkinson's Foundation, so Parkinson's disease is the main consideration. And the two targets we talk about for Parkinson's disease are either the subthalamic nucleus or the globus pallidus. This is a discussion we usually have uh, very closely with the neurologists. Um, in terms of what the best target is for your symptoms. Depending on exactly what type of symptoms you may have, your response to medication, and also um, if you have any mild cognitive impairments, we may choose one target over the other. But in the end, they're both efficacious. Uh, they both treat the symptoms quite well, and they can both reduce uh, uh, medication usage. There are obviously other mood disorders we use uh, deeper brain simulation for, such as essential tremor and dystonia. And really, there's a whole litany of different targets that, uh, we, that are under uh, investigation. Uh, typically, I implant people with chronic pain and epilepsy as well. But you can see here even tantus, Alzheimer's. These are very, very early experimental indications. Uh, but deep brain simulation is something that is quite old. So even though it was approved in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, um, it goes back decades before that. And we're still trying to figure out the exact best indications to use this, use this for going forward to help uh, patients with different pathologies. So a little bit different from what Dr. Elmore talked about in terms of who are good cans for DBS. So obviously we look at uh, medication, we look at pathology. Um, important thing for uh, me as a surgeon is people who are medically fit. And you can see I have an asterisk there. Previously, probably 10, 20 years ago, we would um, be a bit more hesitant to implant certain patients uh, with uh, certain chronic uh, comorbidities or even based on age. And I'll tell you that that is not true anymore. 
Um, really, I have implanted patients as young as the age of 11 and implanted patients as old as, uh, I think 89 is my oldest. Age is not a contraindication for the surgery. And really we've done so well in, in terms of managing medical comorbidities. Um, it's more of going through the appropriate preoperative workup beforehand. So a lot of patients these days have diabetes, they're on blood thinners. It's just important to manage those comorbidities and those medications before proceeding uh, with uh, deep brain simulation surgery. So medically fit is a bit of a, a, bit of a misnomer. Uh, so unless people are truly, truly unhealthy, usually they can be optimized in a certain way that makes them a good candidate for deep brain stimulation surgery. So the poor candidates are those with untreated psychiatric disorders, um, advanced cognitive impairments. So we do implant people with mild cognitive impairments because they still do benefit from this type of surgery. Uh, but that kind of gets back to what I was telling you about in terms of which, uh, which target we choose. So it's never just one target fits all for one patient. We want to make sure we discuss the patients uh, individually to make sure we're picking the right target um, and the right indication for them. And again, the major medical problems with the asterisks, we want to make sure that we manage those uh, medical comorbidities. And finally, Dr. Allenborg did talk about this or touch upon this, unrealistic goals and expectations. It's important to understand that DBS is not a cure for epilepsy, or sorry, for epilepsy, for Parkinson's disease, um, but it, it can greatly improve quality of life. Um, but you might not see that right away after the DBS system is implanted. It often takes a few programming sessions. So when Dr. Allen Bogan or your neurologist sees you in two to four weeks, um, you might not feel that you're that you've gotten the tremor reduction, for example, and that might take even more programming sessions over weeks to months. It's important to understand that this is a stepwise process that even after surgery has to be fine tuned uh, uh, based on individual needs and pathology. So what does DBS surgery entail? Let's get to the nitty gritty. This is a, a very common uh, picture that I see. So this is somebody with a frame on and invariably probably 90% of patients that I, that I implant in this fashion ask to have their picture taken by their family. Um, maybe not the thumbs up both of them, but uh, this, one, this one's pretty happy. This is a bit of a misnomer here. What is the typical workflow of DBS? Is this every patient? Not, not quite. There are so many different ways to do DBS th these days. It's always implanting the electrode, but we can implant them in so many different ways using different equipments. And I think what we're developing at Ascension is a pretty unique uh, uh, a system that's really gonna focus on the patient experience and patient comfort. So 20, 30 years ago, when you talked about doing DBS, everybody implanted it pretty much in the same way. And that was to put this frame on. So patients would come in, have their MRI, and the MRI is very important for planning purposes. And we get the MRI, it can be even up to a year beforehand. I usually like to get it a few months before surgery, but certainly it doesn't have to be in the days leading up to surgery. It's never a rush. I like to look at the MRI beforehand to make sure that I can understand the patient's anatomy, and I need to plan where the electrode's going. But obviously, first step is always getting that MRI. And then the second step, in a typical workflow, the patient would come in, have their frame placed, have the electrodes uh, put in, and then it'd be discharged after that happened, and then come back on a separate day to have the, uh, the battery put in. So this is kind of, again, what the typical workflow would look like. And some of you who've studied this may uh, recognize this picture, uh, the second picture right here, and that's called the Lexcel head frame. Um, and some patients are uncomfortable with this um, and uh, have a bit of hes hesitancy to go through surgery because of this. Patients come in the day of surgery and we put this on actually in the preoperative area. Uh, those pins actually do go into the skull. It is a little bit uncomfortable, but I do tell patients it's the worst part of the day. Once it's over, it's over. And obviously once surgery is done, we take this off. The reason why we use a frame is because it actually helps us localize in 3D space where we're putting the electrodes. I use the MRI to plan exactly where it's gonna go in the, in the brain, but the frame and the CT on the day of surgery are, are essential because that actually merges with that MRI and shows me in 3D space where I put the electrode. So what we're developing at Ascension is very unique. Uh, there's only two places in Michigan that do it this way, and uh, only a few places uh, actually in, um, in the US that do this. And we're using actually custom 3D printed frames for each patient. And this is called the Starfix system. And it's exactly kind of it's exactly what you see here. It's this white structure, and so this would be uh, this would be a frame for bilateral placement in a patient. And I'll tell you exactly how that works. So 
as opposed to having this frame placed uh, on the day of surgery that's uncomfortable, um, we bring patients in actually a couple weeks beforehand. We make four tiny, tiny little incisions in the, in the scalp, about a centimeter wide. We do this under local sedation or general anesthetic, depending on patient comfort. And what we actually do is we implant these little tiny skull fiducials. These are only about a centimeter wide um, and they sit underneath the skin. And here is showing a, a, up to five being implanted, but we usually implant four, uh, two at the crown, usually and two at the back. Um, and these sit under the skin, we close them up and then the patient gets a CT and goes home the same day. So this is something, it's a, it's a procedure that takes maybe 15 or 20 minutes. And like I said, it can be done under a local anesthetic or even a general anesthetic, depending on the patient comfort. Uh, and this is what we consider, um, I say stage zero, but it could be stage one in, in, uh, in your eyes. This is the first step to get to, uh, towards to, um, to get the lead implanted. And why this is important, the fiducial placement, is we actually use this specifically to design that 3D print, printed frame. Every single frame is unique to each individual patient. And I use this information with the MRI to actually design it myself. And then I send it off to the, uh, to the company to create. So you can see here in, in terms of trajectory planning, um, this is the patient's uh, MRI. And that green thing is actually the frame that's being made based on the, uh, based on the skull window. And it's, uh, it's these little legs right here are actually where the, um, uh, where the frame sits. And that's where I place the skull fiducials. So each frame is unique. We can't use it for any other patient. It's made specifically for you. Um, and it's delivered and sterilized the same day that your surgery is. So this is pretty much the stage zero, zero that I say before the actual surgery. And then we bring you back for the actual lead implantation. So this is the big day. Um, you can expect a lead implantation to take about three or four hours, uh, depending on if we're doing one side, if we're doing both sides. To give you a typical idea of what happens on the on lead implantation day, patient comes in early in the morning. The night before, the patients actually stop all their, uh, um, all their dopaminergic medications. The reason why we do that, much like Dr. Allenboyne was saying for the on-off testing, we actually want patients uh, to be uh, to be off their medications. We want patients to demonstrate their abnormal movements and their tremors because that can actually help us in the operating room to localize where we are and to see if we're, if we're in the right spot and can improve the tremor intraoperatively. We actually turn the system on in the operating room and we can actually see patients' tremor disappear, which is very satisfying for us, but it's also a good indication that we're in the right place. So patients come in on lead implantation day. They already have their fiducials uh, in their scalp. The frame's already been made. Um, as I mentioned, you're off your medications. You go into the OR, we give you a light anesthetic, and then we place you in a comfortable headrest. Um, and then we open up those old fiducial incisions. Uh, we place this custom fitted frame on, and we make a burr hole, which is a small hole in your skull to insert the electrode. I know there's a lot of hesitancy in terms of, uh, in terms of going for a brain surgery. Obviously, that can be a scary thing. To be honest, the way I say this to my patients, this is actually a minimally invasive neurosurgery, believe it or not. Um, the hole that we make in the skull is only about 1.4, 1.5 centimeters. It's quite small. The electrode itself is about one, it's less than a one and a half millimeters in width. It's a very small electrode. Uh, we place it under very specific, what we call stereotactic uh, um, uh, methods. That means we use our 3D navigation to put it in the right spot. Uh, we spend a long time making sure it's in the right spot. But in the end, it's a small hole, a small hole in the skull and one small electrode in the brain. And we actually do consider this minimally invasive neurosurgery. So after the patient goes to sleep, we make a little incision in the scalp. The scalp is about two inches in size. Uh, we make that hole that's about 1.4, 1.5 centimeters. Dr. Allen Bogan previously showed you that cap, that cap system we actually drill into the skull. Old, old style caps used to be quite bulky and uh, patients, especially those who are bald, might notice that uh, after they had healed up, they might have little horns on their head for lack of a better word. Um, all the newer systems don't really have that. The newer uh, cap systems are actually uh, uh, quite, um, quite short. You might notice a millimeter or two of elevation on your scalp, but really you'd have to kind of put your hand and, and touch down your scalp to feel it. It's really not cosmetically noticeable, even in patients who are bald. 
Uh, and certainly in patients with hair, um, we place it behind the hairline. So after it's healed, it's not noticeable at all. It's a very, very small scar and the, and the hair grows right back over it. So in terms of the intraoperative workflow, this is commonly what we see from the back, from the surgical side. Both of these patients um, are either bald or have been shaved. I'm sorry, I don't remember. <laughs> but uh, we do try to go with a hair spare approach as much as possible. Uh, there will always be some aspect of, of hair we have to shave in order to make our incisions. Certainly, if you'd like us to shave your whole head, we are willing to do that. But if you'd like us to protect as much hair as possible, certainly we're willing to facilitate that to make, because uh, I know that's important for a lot of people. Um, but this is the first part of the operation. We get you set up, we get you positioned, and then we kind of set up our equipment. Of note, this is all that frame-based system I was telling you about. This is not uh, necessarily what we're going to be doing at the Ascension system. So the nice thing about the Ascension workflow with that, with that 3D printed frame is the patient's head is kind of more placed in a, in a comfortable location. When we use frames, we actually have to affix the frame to the bed. And the patient has to lay there for about three, four, sometimes five hours. And that can be uncomfortable. In our proposed workflow, you're still going to be laying in the bed, but the, your, your head is not going to be rigidly fixated. And therefore, it's a lot better for patient comfort. And so that's kind of what this looks like. So this is a custom 3D print frame. This is a star fix system. And this is a uh, this is a, a uni, or sorry, a bilateral system. And what you're seeing right here, this black structure. That's actually what we call the micro drive, and that helps us insert the electrode into the brain. But you'll notice that you're actually missing all of this kind of big bulky equipment uh, that comes with the frame-based system. So the patient's head is just resting more on a, uh, a headrest back here. Like I said, it is much more comfortable. Now, this is always an interesting part for us. It's an interesting part for the patients, and this is our intraoperative testing. Prior to this point, the patients are, are sedated. Uh, you're not asleep. You're certainly not intubated, but you are sleepy. Um, we give you medications that you're not going to necessarily remember the steps that come before it. Um, once we're all set up, we start our testing. And the way we test is twofold. We like to see that we're in the right place of the brain, both by testing with electrodes, but also by testing the patient themselves. So we can actually record the brain on the way in using specialized equipments. And this is part of making sure that we are accurate to the millimeter. Um, like I said, this is, this is very fine, minimally invasive neurosurgery. And it's, you don't see many surgeons or surgeries that say we need to be accurate to the millimeter. And the difference between being off by a couple millimeters one way versus another is the difference of um, a successful versus unsuccessful surgery. So we spend a lot of time planning the surgery beforehand, but you also spend a lot of time in the operating room making sure that we're in the right spot. But to be fair, I always say Dr. Allenbogen has the hardest job afterward doing all the programming, where I have the easy job just putting the electrode in. But what you can see here is kind of an indication of what we're doing. These, these green lines here are actually the, uh, the recordings of the brain intraoperatively. We listen to brain cells as the electrodes uh, uh, go in. And every brain area has a very characteristic uh, chatter, shall we say. Uh, so for example, the subthalamic nucleus, which is a very common uh, place in the brain for Parkinson's, is, uh, is very different from the, um, the thalamus, the, the VIM nucleus of the thalamus, which is, uh, uh, which is the target for a central tremor. So once we're at the place we think we are based on the recordings, that's when we wake the patients up and do our intraoperative testing. And the way this is done, the electrode is in the brain where we, where we think it should be. And then we place some current through the electrode. And I should say the electrode we're using is the electrode that will be implanted. We're not taking something out for testing and putting something back in. So this final electrode is the electrode. And then um, at the time of surgery, usually myself will be there with another, um, um, another expert in neurophysiology. And after having listened to the areas in your brain, uh, we, we put you through a number of tasks. So here's a very common uh, task for, uh, for tremor. We have the patient uh, uh, touch their finger to their nose uh, and then back up, to, <laughs> back up to the examiner's hands. And then we do certain things such as, um, such as holding a cup of water uh, for rigidity, for remove your arms, see if we can improve your rigidity and your stiffness. And uh, we, we document each step along the way using different parameters and seeing if, uh, if we can improve those symptoms. And then we, we take it as high as we can go until we see side effects. Side effects are an invariable part 
of this operation, it's actually important for us to know the threshold for side effects. Um, as you can imagine, if we need to be accurate to the millimeter in the brain, uh, if we're two millimeters off to one side, we could get into the area that controls motor movements uh, of the arm or leg. Um, or we can get to an area that controls uh, numbness and tingling. So patients might say, I start, they, they might say that, oh, I'm feeling uh, tingling in my face. And is the tingling going away? No, it's staying there. So that might tell us that we're, we're a bit off target. Um, however, as you can imagine, you can stimulate a very small area and you can grow that. That's, that's the beautiful thing about uh, deep brain stimulation surgery is it's an adjustable, reversible technology. We can create a stimulation along all four of those contacts of an electrode. We can put it in different direction, directions based on the new technology. Uh, we can turn it up, we can turn it down, we can change different parameters of it. Um, and that's, again, something that's, uh, that's very um, um, important and challenging. And uh, I will leave that to Dr. Ellenbogen for his, for his expertise. But even in the operating room, we do test that because we want to see that we're getting very few or no side effects with kind of a large area of stimulation. We want to see that, for example, tremor goes away or tremor is improved, rigidity is improved. And then when we get higher and higher and higher, then maybe you start getting some numbness and tingling. Because certainly when we're using this in a clinical setting, you might not be going that high to get numbness and tingling, but that gives us information exactly where we are in the brain, and what structures are close by. So again, this is many steps. It's, uh, it's uh, something we take very seriously in, in order to make sure that we're exactly in the place of the brain that we need to be for the long term. Um, because sometimes leads might migrate, which is very, very rare over time, less than 1% of leads. Um, and sometimes leads might not be in the exact place that we want them to be. And we discover that after surgery, and we can actually go back in and reposition the leads. But I would say altogether, that's actually a pretty uh, a rare occurrence. I would say probably only one or two to percent over a long period of time, would we actually have to move a lead because we were in the wrong spot where something moves over time. So to bring uh, to conclusion stage one, and so that's the, the, the lead implantation, we find out where the lead is, we verify it based on our, our electrophysiology, that's the intraoperative um, um, uh, monitoring, and then with testing the patients, and then we secure the lead and close. So remember, this is only about an incision that's about two, uh, two inches wide, and if we do uh, two sides, we're doing both, um, uh, both sides, so two two-inch incisions very small, close them up usually with absorbable sutures. And we actually tunnel the leads underneath the scalp. Um, and they can go off to the left or the right side, depending on patient preference. Uh, and we actually kind of tunnel them just, just above the ear on the left. And then we bring the patient back for their, uh, for their battery implantation. So after stage one, patients usually stay for about a day, believe it or not. Uh, so I rarely see patients stay beyond a day, even the 80 year olds uh, with Parkinson's, they typically go home the next morning, they're ready to go very quickly from uh, because of its minimally invasive nature. We actually don't even put patients in the ICU for this. They're usually uh, admitted to the floor. Remember that patients have been off their Parkinson's medications for some time. So we give them immediately post-operatively. During the post-operative stay, we do get a CT scan of the head to make sure we are in the right place. And then there are certain concerns we do have postoperatively. Um, every surgery has a, a risk profile. This deep brain simulation has a very minimal risk profile. Um, the biggest risk is postoperative confusion. And I don't want to scare you with a number of 10 to 25%. What we say about, well, when I say 10, 25% post-operative confusion, this is actually usually mild confusion upon awaking, uh, awaking from the anesthesia, like right after surgery. Patients might not uh, recall exactly what went on in surgery. That's very common. We do see this most commonly in Parkinson's disease almost exclusively, and that's inherent to the disease process. But this is something that usually disappears within a few hours and certainly by the next day uh, when patients go home. Patients, uh, some patients do have headaches or incisional pain. Um, because we did drill a hole in the skull, we did have to cut the scalp. However, we do, uh, we do anesthetize the scalp using a local anesthetic. Um, so the incisional pain is actually quite low, but patients might have a mild pounding headache uh, that can last up to a couple of days. Very rarely, this might last for a week or longer. And then the kind of the, the big risks are very, very rare. Those of seizures and bleeding. 
Um, I have never seen a seizure happen from, uh, from a deep brain stimulation surgery. Um, any bleed that I've ever seen has been a very small bleed uh, that is not to uh, cause any lasting uh, issue. I've never seen a stroke from this. I would say the risk of a seizure or bleeding from any lead implantation is much, much less than 1%. And again, this is important for risk stratification. We talked about comorbidities. So patients on anticoagulants, we need to make sure we stop them appropriately. These are very common these days. So we discuss with your primary care, with cardiology, with hematology, to make sure we have a good um, understanding of what medications you're taking and what we need to stop before surgery to make sure you don't have a postoperative complication. And then you're almost there. You're almost at the finish line, the IPG implantation. So IPG is implantable pulse generator. It's the battery. Um, it means the same thing. You'll hear it interchangeably used. This is an, an, also an outpatient procedure. Patient comes in. Uh, we put you off to sleep entirely. So you're not waking up for a, at all for any testing. Uh, this is about a 45-minute surgery. And basically what we're doing is the electrode is already uh, in place. Uh, so we open up where we tunnel those leads underneath your scalp. And then we make a second incision uh, in your chest, uh, right underneath your clavicle, either on the left or the right side. And we actually tunnel this electrode to that, uh, to that chest incision with a secondary electrode, what we call an extension lead. And that extension lead connects the electrode to the battery. And the battery, um, depending on which manufacturer you use, uh, is, uh, is a reasonable size. I'm not going to say it's super small. Um, if you are quite thin, it might, uh, you might notice it, uh, but people of average size, uh, we, we situate it underneath, uh, underneath the chest wall, um, just on top of the muscle underneath the subcutaneous tissue and fat. And you'll notice about a one and a half inch incision underneath your clavicle, but otherwise it's really not prominent. Uh, it sits very well and you don't notice the lead either, or the extension lead. Once it's tunneled, uh, it's pretty, um, it's pretty innocuous and the hardware itself, after everything's healed, uh, heals quite well uh, and patients don't really notice it. And it's not really, it's not really visible. Um, and so the batteries, like I said, there are different manufacturers for it. There are different types of batteries. Uh, there are rechargeable and non-rechargeable batteries and that can influence the size too. Um, and like I said, this is the, the, the last part of the surgery where patients are brought back. And it's about a week or two, a week or two later. So patients have had a chance to recover uh, from the electrode implantation. The only new medications we give you are prophylactic antibiotics. So patients can stay on their same Parkinson's medications. You don't need to be off medications uh, whatsoever. Um, and then two to four weeks after that surgery, which is about a month after the electrode goes in, you typically go see your, your neurologist and they start with their first uh, uh, programming session. And then it is a battery. Batteries do have to be changed over time. Uh, the average battery life for a non-rechargeable battery is about four years on average. Um, as Parkinson's disease progresses, uh, you, patients typically need higher, um, higher stimulation current uh, in order to get the same uh, symptomatic relief. And sometimes that accelerates battery depletion. Sometimes we see patients uh, as soon as two years or three years for battery replacements um, or patients who are on lower stimulation settings can be up to five years. I would say three to four years is pretty average after a while. Um, the, a battery replacement is, uh, is very surgery. We bring you in, do in our local sedation. We just open up the old battery site, take the old one out, put the new one in. It's one of the most common things we do uh, and is, uh, is not uncomfortable for the patients um, and it's quick and is done in, like I said, 15, 20 minutes. So just to kind of bring that all together, what are the stages? Uh, stage zero, one, two, I like to call them, or one, two, three, depending who you talk to. Fiducial placement is outpatient, 30 minutes. Um, Lead implantation is the big one. That's the big day. It's an inpatient surgery. It takes about three to four hours. Stay overnight. Go home the next day. So usually stay for about 24 hours. And then uh, the stage two is the uh, battery or IPG implantation. That's an outpatient surgery as well. Um, the actual surgical time is about 40, 45 minutes, 60 minutes for all the anesthesia involved. Patients go home the same day too. And so I just want to very briefly talk about this. I talked about issues of, um, of uh, maybe surgical complications. This is implanted hardware. Hardware itself uh, uh, is, can be prone to complications because it is a foreign body. DBS um, hardware has been through so many iterations of, uh, of innovation and improvement over the years since it was first uh, approved over 20 years ago. Um, that the hardware complication rate is very, very low at this point, I would say. There are a number of tricks and tips that we've, uh, that we've used that we've understood over years of study. 
uh, that I implement um, in terms of uh, making sure that the devices are, are situated well, that they're fixed well, um, and that they have a low chance of erosion, eroding through the skin. And obviously we take uh, great care in making sure that everything is sterilely uh, prepared. So the rates of infection are very low here. The rate of infection I'd say for this hardware is about 1%. The rate of something like an erosion happening, even after five years is only about one, one to 2%. Um, and like I said earlier, uh, there was a previous issue with older hardware where that, uh, where that burr hole, that, that cap there would be a bit higher and that would, uh, that would prone the scalp to be under tension. However, with the newer hardware, we don't really see that because it's a bit situated lower. So I hope I've answered some of your questions and Dr. Ellen's will certainly answered many of your questions. We'll take more at this point, but I did want to uh, nurse uh, navigator again, um, because this is a very important uh, um, program for us. We are just getting off the ground. We, uh, we have everything together. We've just been doing our first patients. We're very excited about this. And I think this is a very exciting opportunity. Uh, and if you're interested in coming through the system, we'd, be, we'd love to see you and uh, talk, to, to talk more about with you. Uh, and certainly we can take any questions you might have right now. Thank you, Dr. Stout. 